Today's a great day because I'm in Steve Sondheim's garden, and I get to ask Steve all about his work today. Uh, and I've got many questions that I've wanted to ask probably my whole life. Hey there, my name is Brian Yorkie, and it's going to be my great privilege today to meet and interview Lee Adams, who has been a hero of mine uh, since I was small. Candor and Ebb have written so many great, important, fabulous musical theater works. Cabaret, Chicago, Curtains, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach are arguably the most successful and finest uh, songwriting team of the 60s. Edward Albee has been, for me, an inspiring, inspiring person to know. I've learned a ton just from watching how the guy looks at the world. To be around someone and see what it means to be be an artist while you're sitting at a picnic table. Come on in, Ed hey. Nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. Oh, hey. This is Bill. Hey, Bill. Mm -hmm. The obvious artificiality of the theater is what appeals to me. I mean, a curtain goes up, there's this couch facing front. What is this? What's on this for? Why is everybody realistically talking in that direction? If mm -hmm. they, and uh, and it's the artificiality and how that w works and how much fun that can be and how to sort of poke fun at it uh, has always engaged me because with the theater it has to be artificial. Lance, what would you say is the most difficult aspect of writing a play? You know, the hardest part about writing a play for me is getting the idea, is the very beginning, is just starting to write. Uh, I, you know, well, you were around Circle Rep. I went around saying I shouldn't write. I, I never, you know, I don't have an idea. I have, I, you know, I shouldn't have started. They expect me to start. I'm not a playwright. They expect me to keep doing this. <laughs> and I used to say that I would write a monologue until someone said, oh, would you shut up? And then you had, <laughs> and then you'd have two points of view, right? That's great. And that's, and that's, and that's conflict. <laughs> These leaps that you just go, whoa, you didn't just do that, did he? And uh, you do that like, um, Hard Knock Life is a great example, too. It's a hard knock life for us. It's a hard knock life for us. Instead of treated, we get tricked. <laughs> What is the happiest moment as a team that you can recollect? As you well, you know it when songs work in shows as you hope they will, or when the, the show gets terrific reviews. But that's more of a relief. Until you've really polished it, you don't know what you've got. And then came the moment of truth when we would call his wife to come downstairs as Patty, come down. She would come down and we would sing the song. And if she didn't like it, we would tell her she didn't know what she was talking about. But when she liked it, that to me was one of the happy moments. It's that particular emotional moment that has the high beyond belief. You do tend to write a lot of political backdrops, but it's always, to me, all your plays are always about the same thing, which is the struggle to find love. Love is the most important thing in life. Love and people. When I direct, I do it for the actors, I want them. But when I write, it's for me. And I've told the story it was about going over to Oscars, having written this school show, and, and I gave it to him because I thought he would want to produce it on Broadway, and, and I waited overnight, and I just knew that when I, just like you, <laughs> that when I over there, he'd say, Steve, you're going to be the first 15-year-old to have a, and Dick and I are so proud to present this, and, he sa and I said, you know, treat me as if you didn't know me. He said, oh, in that case, it's the worst thing I ever read. <laughs> and then, and, but he, he said exactly to me what I said to you, which is he said, I didn't say, I didn't say it wasn't talented. I said, it's no good. And here, if you want to know why it's no good, mm -hmm. I'll tell you. And he yeah. told me. I just love passing on what Oscar passed on to me. Is there a song that you heard and said, damn, I wish I'd written that? Many. What are, what are a few? Oh, 
this silly song from the, from the 1930s. The song is called, I Found a Million Dollar Baby in a Five and Ten Cent Store. It was a lucky April shower. It was the most convenient door. I found a million dollar baby in a five and ten cent store. If you can make a picture mm -hmm. in the listener's mind, a little snapshot in words. She was selling China, and when she made those eyes, I kept buying China. Until the crowd got yeah. wise. <laughs> now, that's, that's a little funny picture. Hey, Lynn, how are you? Are you? Good. We enter laughing. Let's, let's talk a bit about Fiddler. How did this start? I found something called Tavia's Daughters, containing the stories that I had remembered when I was a child. And that was the genesis of Fiddler. And I didn't remember the stories at all, but I just remembered falling in love with them. If you were objective and you looked at them from a, from a distance, they all were about the breaking of a, tr of, of a tradition. I lived, when I was growing up, I was an adopted kid, as you know, and I was living with a, a wealthy, right-wing, highly prejudiced, rich family. And I got to know all of their friends when I was growing up. When they adopted me, the, the, the patriarch of the family, old E.F. Albee, had wanted a grandson, so they got me. They found me somewhere and got me. But I wasn't growing up to be what they, what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They wanted a, a young corrupt CEO or, or, a, or a lawyer or a doctor, something like that. They didn't want a writer. Good God. It probably gave me a lot of objectivity through my life that I was able to be objective about these people who were supposed to be my parents, but of course never were. And I came to the conclusion one day, this turned into a play called A Delicate Balance, ultimately. These people aren't alive. Mm. They've decided to be dead through most of their lives. They're not participating in their lives. Mm. And what could be worse than getting to the end of your life and figuring out you haven't participated in it. Yeah. We wrote a song called New York, New York. It's for this movie with Robert De Niro and Liza. Scorsese came back and in a very kind of embarrassed way said, you know, Bobby feels that uh, the song of the world goes round is stronger than the song of New York, New York, which is the song that he's supposed to be working on all the way through. And he said, uh, I don't know how to ask you this. He said, would, would you take another pass at it? We went back to Fred's house full of irritation and loftiness. And high dudgeon. Ah, some <laughs> actor. <laughs> and so we went into the little room. Uh -huh. And as would often happen with Fred and me, it, uh, either he would have a line or I would play something. And so my hands started going. That's all. And so uh, he asked me to play it again. And inside that vamp there is. Oh my God, of course. Start spreading the news. And so it all comes out, it, it comes out of a vamp, uh, which you didn't intend. Mm -hmm. To be a melody. This is this is just something to put. This is something to put a melody on top of. We get to experience an emotional bond with other people that other groups, I'm sorry, do not. You go from production to production to production and, and have all the, the the creative joy of that, but you also fall in love with a whole bunch of people who love you back. It's a swell place to live. <laughs>